introduce myself. Uh, I'm Mario Paniagua, Deputy City Manager. And here tonight is Councilman Michael Nowakowski, uh, Councilman for District 7. I just want to welcome everyone and thank you for coming out. It's so important to get your input, especially when it comes to the city budget. It's about us spending your tax dollars wisely. So thank you for showing up and we'll be here listening to your concerns. And I think we're going to watch a video really quick. Before we kick off the video, I just have a, a couple of announcements. Um, one, we've got an interpreter here, and if, she, if you can introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Sandra, and I'm the interpreter. And we have headsets in the back if for some reason anybody needs, you know, Spanish translation, okay? And in Spanish? Oh, in Spanish. <laughs> and uh, that's... Okay, thank you. So, so tonight, this is one of uh, 20 budget hearings that we're doing citywide. And uh, the point of, of the budget hearing is to get input from the community, as the councilman said. The trial budget is, is essentially a first draft of the budget that the, that the city puts out. And we want to hear your input on, on the budget and what the proposals are. Um, and then once the, all that information is collected from the community, and all the input and comments are collected. That all goes to the city, uh, to the mayor and the city council, um, for consideration on the budget as they do further deliberations and discussion and prepare the budget for next year. Um, and so, as the councilman said, we have a video that explains the budget, and we'll get right to that. Um, and then after that, we've got some cards. If you do want to speak, please make sure you fill out a speaker card, which are in uh, the front of the room. Uh, from here, when you walk in, the cards are all set up there. Fill that out, and we'll make sure that you get to speak tonight. So with that, uh, Christine, go ahead and kick off the video. Welcome to your first look at the City of Phoenix trial budget for 2019-20, proposed by the city manager for public review and comment. The city budget is about people and programs for a stronger Phoenix. Every year, the city prepares a trial budget this process gives you, our residents, an opportunity to share your priorities and feedback on how tax dollars are spent. Three important points about this year's budget. It is balanced, which is required by law, and there is a surplus to allocate toward people and programs. Also, for the first time since the recession, ongoing revenues are equal to ongoing costs. We have a nearly $1.4 billion structurally balanced general fund budget thanks to Phoenix's continued strong economy and sound leadership by the mayor and city council. These efforts have led to a projected surplus of $55 million, of which $35 million is in ongoing resources and $20 million is in one-time resources. Over the next several minutes, we'll provide you a high-level view of the recommendations for how that surplus could be spent. Approximately 70% of the surplus is proposed for employee compensation, and the remaining 30% is proposed for services. And $5.5 million to continue investing in the Public Safety Pension Reserve Trust Fund to protect against unexpected downturns in investments. The 2019-20 trial budget continues to provide the core services residents expect. Chief among these is public safety. In addition, many recommendations are focused on improving neighborhoods, parks, libraries, support for outreach and services for people experiencing homelessness, additional street landscape maintenance, and preparations for the 2020 census. The city also continues to invest in maintaining the facilities you depend on and the fleet of vehicles that provide you everything from police response to street cleanups. Besides these proposals, we'll highlight expenditures that help the city address growth in construction and maintain the city's wastewater infrastructure. First, general fund recommendations. 
The general fund is made up of several different sources of revenue, including sales taxes, state shared revenue, and property taxes. Three-fourths of the general fund pays for police, fire, and courts, with a smaller portion, the remaining 25%, going for everything else, like libraries, parks, senior services, arts, and administrative and support functions. The primary focus of the general fund service additions is public safety across a wide array of departments. Here are some of the proposals. Eight new firefighter positions to provide 24-hour operations at Fire Station 55 at I-17 and Joe Max Road in North Phoenix. At funding for seven sworn fire positions, creating a new ambulance rescue unit at Fire Station 58 to improve emergency response times in Southwest Phoenix. The creation of one new fire department crisis intervention unit and in the police department, de-escalation training and community response services support for officer involved shootings. These recommendations are based on public feedback from last year's budget process and the city's traumatic incident intervention resources ad hoc committee. Another key area of public safety funding is focused on improving police support processes, using civilian staff to free up police officers' valuable time for calls and service. First, the addition of 10 civilian positions to support a federally mandated transition to the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting National Incident Based Reporting System and second, the addition of 13 positions to streamline police booking procedures and create two new centralized booking centers to get officers back on the street faster. The trial budget also provides funding for increased inspection capacity to ensure buildings are meeting fire safety codes. Other public safety allocations, public defender representation for veterans and individuals with mental illness, in human services, add a caseworker and a vehicle to provide mobile victim advocacy. Security guard staffing at every library. Technology funding for cybersecurity to protect the city's infrastructure. In all, the trial budget proposes spending an additional $6.5 million on these and other public safety additions. Now, let's look at where you live, investments in programs to strengthen neighborhoods. First, the budget would allocate approximately $1 million to add staff to work with neighborhood groups, to clean up blight, work with nearby businesses, and improve response times for neighborhood issues. Parks and Recreation would see eight new park ranger positions to increase patrol coverage at neighborhood and urban parks for a cost of about $1.1 million. Street transportation and public works would support neighborhoods by transitioning staff from a temporary to permanent status to clean up encampments and washes and right of way for a cost of $970,000. Historic preservation would also get $75,000 to support historic property preservation. In all, neighborhood revitalization would see an additional $3.5 million in funding. Next, community services additions restore some desired programs to strengthen the community and expand other resident requests, including restoration of Sunday library hours at four branches means all libraries will be open to provide greater access to in-demand books, movies, classes, and programs for library patrons of all ages. Expand the Phoenix Teens program for youth at 10 city sites providing youth programs six days per week at a cost of $448,000. Providing case management assistance for homeless seniors and grant funding for arts organizations for youth and underserved communities would also be included. The budget would also add $1.3 million for long-standing street landscape maintenance needs, increasing frequency of maintenance from three to four times per year. New this year, a proposal to allocate funding to implement participatory budgeting or other projects in city council districts. Lastly, the city will invest in outreach to encourage residents to take part in the 2020 census. 
Given the move to digital form submission this census, the additional funds will help to ensure hard to count and hard to reach populations participate so that Phoenix gets its fair share of the approximately $866 million in annual revenues allocated through federal programs for public safety, transportation, housing, and human services. Overall, added general fund expenditures outlined in the trial budget total $55.2 million and would add 131 positions to strengthen our people, programs, services, and infrastructure. Moving on to propose non-general fund additions for a variety of services. Strengthening our street transportation department with 11 positions added or converted to full time for a variety of services to support increasing work in the right of way and the recently expanded street maintenance funding in the capital improvement program budget, $768,000. Water services will see 21 positions and approximately $2.9 million in funding to keep up with demand at the department's 91st Avenue treatment site, the state's largest. The site is currently treating 180 million gallons of water a day for more than 2.5 million residents in five cities. Finally, 19 positions for planning and development to address increasing construction demand, including reduction of turnaround times for pre-application submittals and complex commercial architectural plans. Added staff to ensure adherence to fire system requirements and ADA accessibility codes, and to maintain a 24-hour turnaround time for residential inspections. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about the 2019-20 trial budget. We hope that you'll review additional details in the budget pamphlet available at one of our 19 community budget hearings and online at phoenix.gov slash budget. Please share your feedback in whatever way works best for you at a public meeting or via email at budget.research at phoenix.gov. You can comment on the city's social media at City of Phoenix AZ on Facebook or Twitter and use hashtag Phoenix Budget or call us at 602-262-4800. Thank you for being part of this important process. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with the speaker cards, and uh, the, the first one we've got, if, if when, when I call your name, if you could come up to this podium right here to, to my left uh, and speak into the microphone, and then we'll make sure to, to catch you on the, on the video, and this goes out on, on the YouTube video, um, and there will be three minutes for each speaker. Lisa Glow. Good evening and thank you very much for having us this evening. I'm the CEO of Central Arizona Shelter Services, the largest and longest serving adult emergency shelter in Arizona in 35 years, and thank you for your support from the City of Phoenix. We also have a family shelter in Sunny Slope, the second largest in our county. So we've accomplished a lot this year. We've increased our private fundraising by 78%, over half a million. We've increased support from regional cities in addition to Phoenix, Phoenix being a large supporter and we've had many other accomplishments. We've received some private funding for senior navigators to work with the t over 1,200 seniors who are in our shelter. Today, one in three people staying in our shelter are over the age of 55, many in their 60s and 70s, and I'm gonna give you a handout on that in just a moment. We've acquired a new building in Glendale to serve as a services hub, a navigation center, not a shelter, which will be really critical in an area that's currently very underserved. Along with that, we've hired a West Valley housing navigator to fill a gap in the West Valley. We listened to the community. They said, this is what we need. Overall numbers, we served over 4,000 people, family members, and single adults. Of those, 1,300 exited to permanent housing, which is no easy feat because we serve the chronically homeless and many people who have been homeless for a long time. At our family shelter, over 500 individuals were served in Sunny Slope, and downtown were the remainder, over 4,000. We also serve chronically homeless veterans. 527 were served last calendar year. 
And at our family shelter, sorry to jump around here, we have a quality childcare program, five star, the only one that we know of in an emergency shelter because it's really critical that children get the head start they need. We are facing many increased financial burdens, uncontrollable challenges this year. Funding cuts from the United Way, we faced last year, again this year, about 236,000. General salary and benefit increases, about 110,000. And increased char facility charges from the Human Services Campus for our downtown facility at over 200,000. So our budget shortfall before private fundraising is 546,000. We're hyper-focused on continuing to provide quality programming and meet the continuing demands. Um, the point in time count came out and it's another 22% increase this year in the number of unsheltered individuals throughout Maricopa County. I think we're all seeing how many more people are living on the streets. We turn 350 people away monthly who want shelter in our adult shelter and we have waiting lists for families. So what we're planning this next year is to continue to expand our senior housing programs for seniors on social security, open the Ramsey Norton Glendale Success Center, or navigation center. We're going to be adding some beds inside of the adult shelter for the most chronically, um, for the fragile, medically fragile seniors. It's not medical care, but we have two hospitals who are gonna help us put new beds in there and start a new model. We're co-locating more behavioral health services in our shelter, and we are looking to build a separate shelter that would be for seniors only, seniors medically frail. We're working on pathways to GED, community colleges, and more with our partners, and developing eviction programming. So tonight, we're asking for your support of CAS to help us meet these increased costs. In addition to your support you already provide, again, thank you. And if you would consider adding half of that, it would be 258000 additional. We'll privately raise the other half, but for those uncontrollable costs, it would provide us the support we need to continue to meet the demands and continue to expand where we know we need to expand. Um, thank you for your consideration, and I'm going to give you a couple of handouts. I don't know if I take questions. Thank you, Lisa. The next speaker is Josh Strasberg. Hi, thank you guys for your time and your support for our great city and communities. I'm the Block Watch lead for Volterra, a community right here in the West Valley, and we are seeing an increased number of transients and homeless population in our community, and with those things comes an increase in crime. Um, and kind of looking through the brochure, I see that the, with under human services, there is some money allocated towards the Phoenix Cares program, but as a former case manager at CAS that Lisa was just talking about, um, I was a veteran case manager there, and they last year lost their veterans program. So as the largest homeless shelter in Arizona, um, it being an emergency shelter, I feel very strongly about assisting them and helping them get the funding that they need. We're seeing, we're starting to see more and more homeless and transients in our community. It's not good enough just to throw them in somewhere. We need to have the programs. They, they need those steps to become successful. I can tell you that when I worked at CAS in about the eight months that I was a veteran case manager, I myself housed about 45 veterans using their program. There's a lot of things that our community does need um, without, again, I'm not very well versed on the budget. We have some things that our teens need in, in this area. There is nothing for our teens to do. That's where we're seeing a lot of home invasions, graffiti, crime. Um, I believe there was supposed to be a community center put in at the corner of 99th and Lower Buckeye. And I was just kind of wondering if we know where that stands, if something like that is gonna be available for, for our youth and our community. Because if we can keep them active, we can help keep them out of trouble. That's all I had to say. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Jennifer Rouse. Thank you. Um, Yes, I agree. Please fund the human services campuses, uh, everything that Lisa and Josh said, I agree with. Um, homelessness, it is something that has reached out into Levine and Estrella Village. It's much more prevalent than we realized. Um, you don't see the encampments until somebody points it out to you and it almost feels like they're everywhere. Um, 
yes to the light rail. I just I wanted to say that please fund some outreach for it because the community had stated that they weren't hearing about it. Um, social media is great, but if you're not on the internet, it's hard to get that information um, and expand it responsibly. I'm very excited about coming to South Phoenix. Uh, every library every day. I don't know if anybody else here wanted to say that, but our libraries offer early literacy and reading programs for our children. Um, please budget to build and maintain our neighborhood city parks. We have three or four dirt lots out in Levine. I know there's one here in Country Place that has not been built because there's not funding to maintain it yet. Um, I, I say this because there are some wonderful mobile units out there that can teach kids about sports, about, there's a gaming unit, there's also one that teaches them about tech, and there's a fourth one I can't remember offhand. I would love to see that in all of our neighborhoods. It gives our, our children something to do. It gives them, tech especially, can, it, it will change their lives. It is the future. It is, is a very um, wonderful career for them. They can make money. They can, they can just change their futures with that. Uh, the other thing was we needed to staff and program fund, st uh, fund the programs for our new, our new community center at Cesar Chavez Park. Uh, we would also like to request, and I, I say this as a special needs mom, please put in some short-term funding for staff and supplies to implement programs in collaboration with our schools until that community center is built. Um, have funding to train the staff there to and how to serve our children, our special needs children. And please also fund, um, implement like a special needs town hall for Levine and Estrella Village in South Phoenix to educate our city, county, and our organizations on our special needs populations. Um, and lastly, please fund pay increases for our public safety employees. Our, um, I cannot say enough, I'm very appreciative of police and fire. They took the pay cuts, they took benefit cuts years ago to help balance the budget. They have done more with less, and I know that there was, um, they're approved to have 3,125 officers. I think that needs to be increased. Um, I, I also think that in some way it's on us as a community to educate our neighborhoods on just what they have been trained on because I hear a lot of people calling for them to be trained in de-escalation de de and um, the CIT or the crisis intervention and they are being trained, they have been trained, they're going through the trainings, they're constantly being trained even more but we're taking, um, we're, we're kind of generalizing police across the country but we have the, plus, the best police department in the country in my opinion. So that was it. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Vicki Jaquez. Good evening and thank you. I apologize for the way I dress, but I'm a school bus driver for teenagers, so you know what, you have to try to engage. So anyway, um, my name is Vicki Jaquez. I am a community leader. I am a um, Block Watch Advisory Board member, uh, Phoenix Neighborhood Patrol, new school bus driver for high school, high school teenagers, and um, pretty much I'm involved in a lot of everyday things. I go to a lot of community meetings, um, block watch meetings, local neighborhoods, and I'm also getting calls on just different things that are happening. Um, right now we've got community, communities that are begging for help, um, speeding vehicles through their neighborhoods, so we need more officers. Um, we've got, um, pedestrians that are crossing and getting killed. And um, regarding Officer Rutherford, um, that was in my neighborhood. Um, I feel very strongly um, that we really need to start um, outreach more for, again, in, in informing people that they need to slow down when you see officers. That being said, they also need to slow down for bus, buses. Um, on a daily basis, I come across 30 to 40 vehicles that don't even bother. Um, and I'm not going through sections that have medians. So if you're seeing kids um, and you see a bus stopped, pay attention because one of these days 
We have not yet had somebody, uh, a child killed recently, but it's gonna happen. Um, and I see that every day. So please, um, more officers to help with that aspect also. Um, the other thing is thank you um, for everything that's being budgeted for the police, the human services. Um, I'm another one for light rail. Um, we do need that. Um, and for police officers, I know that the goal is 3125. We have not reached that yet. As someone that does the Citizen Police Academy, I see the trainings that they go to regularly, um, yearly, and it, monthly even. So if you choose to, there is a program that you can go and see what type of trainings they are because it is awesome and it does give you a different perspective. Um, streets, um, again, driving through the streets. There is so many potholes, it's unreal. Um, one question that I had is how is it that it, they lessened the law on the point scale for people crossing a bus stop, crossing stop sign? Because I've been hearing from the police officers they really don't engage it anymore because they reduced it down not only the points, but it's not even a misdemeanor anymore. So that's, I mean, it's, it's unreal. So if we could investigate that, because um, that's seriously important. I feel there's a lot of people that are thinking that, oh, hey, it's nothing, they'll just cross it. Anyway, um, that is all I have to say again, thank you. Um, and I'm sure I'm gonna be at others because uh, this is very important and I, I thank you guys for the opportunity to be able to allow us to ask for more sources. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Sharice Walls. Can, can you hit the microphone for her? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having this for us and coming to our school and our neighborhood. Um, I'm Sharice Wolf. And there we go. Okay, I'm pulling everything out of the way. I am a community leader out here. I'm part of the Block Watch. Um, I'm one of the Block Watch leaders. And I've been, this is like the second or third one I've come to. My questions that I've got for you guys, and Michael, you probably know this very well. We have been here, I've been here for 15 years, since 2004. I built out here because Country Place is one of the largest communities out here, but we are part of the Estrella Village Park and we're part of the, this beautiful area out here, Southwest Valley. We have been promised a park sitting right behind us that looks like a trash dump. It's an 8.1 8, 8 acre park. We were promised that 15 years ago. We were promised a recreation center over near Target that was to be built with a fire station. Do you see one there? Do you see a recreation center? Do you see a fire station? How much bigger do we have to get before we get the fire station? At least, if nothing else. So I noticed in the budget you've got quite a few things and I'm very proud to see that, I'm very happy. But I still have the questions of what do we do with our children and our families when we don't have the necessary ingredients that we're supposed to be having. This area is supposed to have this. Every subdivision was built with a park in mind for it. The city has said, no, we're not gonna build the parks. That's park, parks and recreation. Park and recreation came in and said, we can't build it because we have no money. We have been paying for this with impact fees. We have been paying for this with our tax dollars. Nothing. We have bus stops, but no buses. I was told by Mayor Stanton back a year ago, if I wanted to get on a bus, call Uber and take me up to, to the uh, Van Buren to catch a bus. Now, I'm sorry, but where are the buses? Where's our public transportation out here? How big do we have to get? We are the size in the Estrella Village of Tempe, Tempe, Arizona, and we are that size of all the homes and all the people out here but yet we are denied 
bus service, as simple as that is, and we've been paying for it with our tax dollars. Where is it? When are we going to get it? We have ans we want questions. We have an we want answers for those questions. I want to know where the things are going to be at and when. You promised me, Michael, as we talked earlier, about four years ago, we were looking into this. It is still nothing's taken place. We spent half of the year designing a park. It's not there. It's getting worse and worse out here. The traffic out here is horrendous. You can't go down Country Place Boulevard hardly anyway without somebody going over the 26 mile per hour. When we ask for speed bumps, we're told, hey, you have to have a complete study made, which will take one year to get the speed bumps, and then you need to have so many houses sign up for these. The areas we're asking for them has no houses, but you need to still get the houses within 500, 1,000 feet of your area you want the speed bump at. We own both sides of the street. Why can't we put the speed bump there? Well, we can put it there, but you still need to get the houses around you. Bureaucratic just ties up everything, and we need to stop this. We need to start working with the communities. There are communities out here that need help, even more so than Country Place does. But no one is helping us. No one is talking to us. We have to go on to next door, complain about something in order to get somebody to listen. That should not be the way it is. Our city council people, our the people that are in control should be out here with us, talking to us. And we have nobody. We are out here as a completely forgotten area. I call us the forgotten zone. Is that what we are, Michael? Are we the forgotten zone out here? Is Southwest Valley just part of the city that pays for the taxes, but we see none of the resources from those taxes? When are we going to have these things happen? Thank you very much for your time. I hope, and, oh, and definitely take care of the police department because they're taking care of us. One officer, two officers, 75 miles of, of area they have to cover, that is ridiculous. We need more officers, and we need our fire station. Thank you so much, sir. Y'all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is Lisa Perez. Thank you, Councilman Nowakowski, uh, Mario, for the opportunity to speak today at uh, this uh, community budget meeting. Um, my name is Lisa Perez, and I'm a resident, and I am also the chair of the Estrella Village Planning Committee. I'm the president of the Toscano Elementary PTO, which is the Fowler Elementary School District. I am also on the executive committee of the Phoenix Community Alliance in downtown Phoenix, and I'm also a mom, lives here. Only reason I rattle that off is because, as many of us that are here today, we have many hats that we're wearing. We care about different things depending on our position and what we serve on, correct? So this is important, and I apologize like Vicki for my appearance. I'm a consultant, and if I'm not going to a meeting, this is pretty much all you get. Um, I wanted to come out today, and it literally had to beg my partner. I was like, I don't want to go. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. This is really important. I, it's, it's important for us to be involved in this. We're the furthest west besides District 5, who is at 107th Avenue also, and we do feel like we're the lost zone, and I have many conversations with Sharice about this, but we're not. It's a good area. It is growing by leaps and bounds. As the chair of the Australia Village Planning Committee, I can vouch for the amount of houses that are coming into our area, which concerns me for our streets, concerns me for our police and our medical, and concerns me for the infrastructure that we do not have in this area and that is necessary. Having said that, it's very easy to stand up at a budget meeting and complain about what we're not getting in our area, and that does us no good and is pretty darn unproductive. What I want to say is, I am generally supportive of this. I was incredibly happy to see all the very specific programs that are being um, more robust, the neighborhood services. Because I, after fire and police, I think NSD and our streets transportation department are what neighbors care about. We care if a pothole is going to take out our tire. We care if there's illegal dumping. 
These are the things that we care about because they, they hit so close to home. And Lisa, uh, your comments are exactly right. We have been fortunate in Australia Village to not have a homelessness issue, but we know it's coming. We are a, we're a population that's about to happen. I've had a very brief conversation with the chair of the Levine Village Planning Committee. Do we put a, 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 a committee together to start to discuss this? Because what do we do? But so I agree, homelessness is very important. I love what we're doing with street transportation. I love that you guys put together the accelerated maintenance, which I think is great and important. I hope the next three years after that is gonna be important. Um, of course, like I said, the police cams, incredible importance for our, not only the safety of our officers, the safety of our residents to know what is actually happening. So this is a good program. And then of course the library. We don't have a library. Our closest library is Cesar Chavez, all the way in Levine, and Desert Sage and Encanto. So increased hours for anybody that wants to just go apply for a job. It's, it's the internet, it's not just books anymore. This is programming. This is a place for people to go. It's a place for you to look for a job. These are critical services in our area, and for us to have extended hours, I am all for it. Um, having said all of that and, and the importance that I just want to tap on a couple things, um, it is true. There has been, when I moved here in 2013, and the rumor and the conversations that I've had with Inger Erickson and others about this regional park, and I get it. We get it. There's no money for anything. We get it. There's excess property. I see Mr. McBride in the audience. We have excess property that has been outlined in our area by the CVS at 67th Avenue and Lower Buckeye, it's supposed to be a library, right? The regional park here, fire station, etc. So the question is, and Councilman, I ask you this in your last year of your term, can we have a conversation about this park? Can we have a study? Can we have somebody look at it? We know there's no money, but I think that what's happening with Hans Park could be an opening. There's the Conservancy, there's PCA in the city that's looking and they're raising the money outside of the city. Can that be something that's going to be done? Is this something we can look at or is the answer no and this property is just going to go away? And if it is, fantastic. Let us know and then, and then we all know that. But I think those conversations are important for us to have so that we're not out here just spinning our wheels and getting angry that nothing's happening. So Councilman, I ask you to help us to maybe you know, just jumpstart that conversation. And then the second thing I want to bring up, which I know is at the city's jurisdiction, and that is the light rail initiative that's coming on the August ballot, if it doesn't get stopped in court. Why this is important to this area is it was literally one of the only things that we had on Proposition 104 to vote for, and that was light rail down I-10. If this initiative passes, it will go away. Now our area, I can't be a NIMBY, I moved here afterwards, it's all warehouse, that is the Southwest Employment Center, Southwest Regional Employment Center. We need places for people to be able to, all the, let me just back up, all of the cases that we have in Roosevelt up by I-10, we stipulate that they have to have bike racks or they have to have a walking path to get to light rail. If that goes away, what was the point of all this exercise that we've been doing for the last couple of years? Light rail, whether you use it or not, is going to be critical, not just to our area, our area, but Maryvale to the north. And we have a lucky design, I'll say that right now, because it goes down the freeway, so it's not impacting businesses or residents like all the other lines have done. So I think it's something that the city really should take a look at. If this happens, what is your backup plan? Rapid transit? Are we gonna do something to, in, to increase the, the mobility in this area? Because I can't ride a bike from here to there because I'll get hit by a semi and it's dangerous. And so we just need to take a look at it. And I know these are big questions and money is always involved. But I know you guys are smart people and employ a lot of smart people. So we ask you for that. I thank you again for the opportunity and thank you for having the community budget meetings. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, the last card that we have is Mr. R. Miller. Oh. Not to speak. Okay. so. Sorry, you did mark not to speak, so uh, no, no need. Uh, but we do have uh, your comments on here. Parks for people and dogs, rec center, family friendly restaurants, um, fire depot, police, adjacent street light and residential areas, spay and neuter program. So thank you very much. Those are all the cards that uh, we've got. Um, any, anyone else? Okay, so. So I want to thank you all for coming out and to address some of those issues, right? So I live out in the Levine area, and we've been wanting a community center forever. I've lived out there for 17 years, and one of the things is that the city, even though I'm a city council member, I couldn't get a community center, and it took me about 17 years to do that. 
but it was really the community coming together, working together, and making sure that the city heard us loud and clear, including the council member, but beyond the council member, right? But one of the things is that there's a makeup of impact fees and all that kind of stuff. So there's a formula that goes around. So what the city does is they go out, and they look at future neighborhoods, future development, and they go out and purchase properties. So we actually, per is it about 80 acres or how many acres are out? How about the one over here, the regional park? About 38, 40 acres of land where we have planned in the future uh, a big regional park where we're going to have, right now we were able to move up the precinct, the police precinct, um, up by eight years. So we were able to build that at an accelerated rate. But now we're looking at building a fire station in the future, a whole park with its rec center and all that kind of stuff. But that's all in the future. But what's really great is to start talking about it and start designing and making plans for it. So once we have it in paper, what we found out in Levine, then it starts to move a little faster. And you keep on going to these meetings and you keep on talking about it until it becomes reality. And that's my recommendation. I know we have some Jennifer's here basically nodding her head because she's been a part of that for the last 12 to 15 years. So that's what it takes. And right now with the freeway, the 202, you might be either pro freeway or against the freeway, but that's really gonna help us with the development out here and bringing more families out here, bringing more businesses, and that means more developments with our, with our parks and other facilities that we, we need out here. So it's gonna take time. You gotta have a little bit more patience. And with your park out here, I think that's something we can really start talking about. We started looking at a design for it. Now we need to find the, the, the maybe the 3PI monies or so that we have out there, but we need to keep that conversation going so that can happen. But I just really want to thank also the community out here. I mean, we have some great leaders out here that patrol these neighborhoods, that are involved in the neighborhoods from policing the neighborhoods, from block watch to neighborhood associations that keep on meeting on a regular basis and they keep us informed about the needs out here. And little by little, things are growing out here. And it's just, if you're in my seat, it's just incredible, the District 7. We have from downtown to Maryville to South Phoenix, Levine, and Estrella Mountain. And we have to treat everyone the same. And Estrella Mountain actually is from the Tolleson, Avondale, all the way up to the I-17 um, border to the south, um, south of the river. I mean, north of the river and um, south of I-10. I so there's a lot of development going on between that area, so things are starting to happen, things are starting to grow, and I just really want to thank you all for coming out here. If I'll be here afterwards, we can start strategizing and, and, and talking about how we did it out in the Levine area and seeing if that plan would work for, for the Australia Mountain area. And I'm not sure if the homeless problem, I'm a big advocate, um, Cass is in my district, and we try to provide all kinds of resources. And one of the things that we created was Phoenix Cares. It was basically a program that it's a tool that we can use where we see a homeless individual that we try to help that person out with resources and, and services. Instead of just picking up someone, we actually listen and, and we try to figure out what the needs are. And once we figure that out, then we can hopefully change that person's life forever. So little by little working together, that's how things happen. So I just really want to thank CAST for everything they're doing. And we've been talking about a regional, regional approach. And they're starting to do that by extending to Glendale and other parts of, um, of, of Maricopa County. So thank you all. Anything else that was talked about? There wasn't that much talk about um, the arts community. So we have the new director of um, our arts um, director. If you want to go ahead and stand up so everybody can get to meet you and maybe you want to just say a little few words of unless y'all are hurry, in a hurry to get home, but let me just introduce him real quick. Thank you, council member. I'm Mitch Menchaca, the new arts and culture director for the city of Phoenix. And our programs are to ensure that cultural services are in every district in the city. And in the trial budget, there is new money for youth and underserved communities. So I hear the plea for activities for our young people 
and for our residents. So we are here uh, for all districts, and I'm just really glad to be out here in the community. I'm originally from Casa Grande, Arizona, so I have been to budget hearings like this, pleading for the same things that your families are wanting with public safety, recreation, neighborhood services. So thank you for giving up your Monday evening uh, to be out here with us. And then there's one more new director that we have. A lot of times we talk about the different services out in our neighborhood. So our neighborhood service um, director will introduce himself. Good evening. My name is Spencer Self. I am the neighborhood services director. It's nice to spend uh, an evening out here with you and to hear what things are important to you in your community. Um, we appreciate that every day and it's really inspiring for us. So just remember it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. I think those are all the newbies, right? Any other newbies in the house? All right, we won't put nobody else on the spot. But some of the other th issues that were addressed were just basically police and fire, that, base, that we need to take care of police and fire, that there needs to be more um, police officers out in the neighborhoods and stuff. We heard that loud and clear. The other thing is that people were very grateful for our libraries being open on Sunday, but not every single library is open on seven days a week. So that's one of the things that we're working to bring that back. So there's a lot of great things that are going on in the city of Phoenix. Um, 10 years ago, we had to make some budget cuts and now we're trying to bring back all those different services and it's gonna be a different Phoenix, hopefully, with all the services and the park rangers and all the different services that we're gonna end up having in the city. So thank you all for coming out and God bless. And if you need any questions asked, I'm right here and I'm ready for you.